Welcome and thank you for uh, joining us today. I am Francesca Dominici and along with David Ports, I am the faculty co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. Today's event on driving social impact with data is the last of several panel discussions that we have hosted over the past years to celebrate the Harvard Data Science Initiative fifth anniversary. I am delighted to introduce our moderator, Lisa Berkman. Lisa is the Thomas Cabot Professor of Public Policy, Epidemiology, and Global Health and Population. Lisa is also the director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies, which is a Harvard-wide initiative, was work focuses on examining the role of social condition and social and economic policies in shaping patterns of population health. Much of her current work related to aging societies and workplace and well-being policies and practices, and to understanding how work organization can better improve employees and family health as well as corporate outcomes. During this event, Lisa will lead our fantastic group of panelists from Amazon Web Services, data.org, and McKinsey in a wide ranging conversation about the value of data and use of data science to respond to and drive societal change. And also about the opportunities and challenges of public private collaboration in this space. Lisa, thank you for being here today and for directing what we'll know will be an informative and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Lovely introduction and David for having this session. Um, it's really a pleasure and I'm delighted to be here today with three truly remarkable panelists whose experience represents a real breadth of perspective on the question of how to drive social impact with data. For the nonprofit foundation space, we're joined by Daniel Mikhailov, executive director of data.org. From the tech sector, we're joined by Nelson Gonzalez, head of global impact computing at Amazon Web Services. And representing the broader industry sector and the consulting industry specifically, we have Ashley Von Hederen, partner at McKinsey and Company. So to all three of you, thank you for being here. So I'm gonna do some short bios and then we'll launch into the discussion. So Daniel Mikhailov has been executive director of Data.org since January, 2021, um, taking the helm at the organization after eight years at the Wellcome Trust, most recently, most recently as founder and head of Wellcome Data Labs, where he led a team creating open source data tools supporting Wellcome's mission. Also while at Wellcome, Daniel coordinated the data and data science aspects of the trust COVID-19 pandemic response. Daniel's own academic background is truly interdisciplinary. He holds a PhD in sociology and communications, an MA in philosophy, and an MA in Chinese studies, and a BS in IT and business management. Nelson Gonzalez is head of global impact computing at Amazon Web Services, and like Daniel, brings an interdisciplinary background to his work. Nelson, from your bio, I note that you've worked at the BBC on social impact programming, managing the campaign of Ashraf Ghani, former president of Afghanistan for UN Secretary General, and you were a research associate at the British Royal Household, working for John R.W. Stott, chaplain to the Queen. Before moving to AWS, Nelson founded Liminal, a learning innovation venture studio supporting investors. Um, and Fortune 500 companies, educational institutions, foundations, and entrepreneurs, and the Declara, a venture-backed SaaS Silicon Valley company that created an enterprise cloud-based knowledge aggregation and social learning platform. Ashley Von Hederen is partner at McKinsey and Company, where she is a core leader in noble intelligence, McKinsey's initiative on artificial intelligence for social good. In this role, Ashley has worked to develop and deploy innovative applications to help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals 
and has written about the role AI can play in responding to national disasters and has led work that uses natural language processing, journey mapping, and causal inference modeling to improve aftercare services for survivors of human trafficking. Ashley is also a leader in the firm's healthcare systems and services and pharmaceuticals and medical products and practices in which role she has served since joining McKinsey after completing a PhD in medical physics in 2010. Welcome to all of you. It's really wonderful to have you here. We're gonna get started with the first question and um, I think we'll go in order of introductions and then the next question will reverse and start with Ashley. So um, here's the question um, and we'll start off with Daniel. Can you tell us how you think data can be used more effectively to promote population well-being and give multiple sectors real-time information on upcoming challenges so that they can respond more thoughtfully? Please, at this point, just let's um, feel free to talk about your own organizations and link in so we get to know you and your work a little bit better. So Daniel? First of all, Lisa, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thanks for Harvard um, to, for hosting this, uh, this great panel and talk. Um, I'll get, give you a little bit of context first uh, for what uh, Data.org does and what I do, and then broaden out uh, to answer your question more fully. So Data.org is a, a platform for partnerships to build up the field of data science and social impact. We were created about two years ago by the Rockefeller Foundation and MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. And the purpose was uh, creating an entity, a nonprofit that helps um, other organizations in the social impact sector use data better to, to meet their mission. The, um, our founders looked at the field and saw that the social impact sector was falling behind fundamentally where the private sector was in its ability to leverage data. And um, we were created to help uh, in this effort. Um, a lot of our work focuses on the question you asked, how, how can we use data better, um, uh, particularly to understand how, 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 how to solve some of the biggest challenges of the day, whether it's the, the pandemic, whether it's climate change. Um, I'll give you a specific example uh, from the pandemic uh, to start answering your question. Um, we have seen during the pandemic how important data is. We've also seen how uh, the problems in the data space um, need to be resolved uh, rapidly for us to unlock its potential. One example would be that before the pandemic hit, it would uh, usually take a couple of years for a clinical trial of a, of a drug or, or vaccine uh, to deliver its data for analysis. In a pandemic, that is far too slow. We've seen during the pandemic that there are huge gaps in data. There are data silos, there are data deserts where, where, where fundamentally we cannot see what's happening in a particular ecosystem. If you look, uh, for example, at many data visualizations produced of the continents, um, looking at um, numbers of infections of COVID-19, you will see that according to them, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the infections are really low, almost non-existent. But of course, we know the problem with that is the data isn't there. It's not that the infection isn't there. So there are many, many real, quest uh, real questions and problems identified during the pandemic with the availability of data. The other area I would say th uh, that the pandemic has taught us about is uh, the issues with the ability of the tools required to analyze that data. So even if the data is there, having software to analyze it uh, is simply not reachable for many organizations that require it. Before the pandemic, the, the uh, traditional um, uh, situation in academia was that every academic team would create their own tools to do analysis. Um, I mean, you, you being from the field of epidemiology know this better than I. So often, often, you know, junior academics would hand code some R to create uh, their, their modeling tools. And of course, the problem with everyone doing their own is there is no standardization. It's hard to reproduce results. Accuracy is a problem. So tools and software and having reliable tools is, is, is one lesson. Data is there, tools is there. The final important missing element that the pandemic has shown us is the people, the social element. So how do we build communities of people who have the skills needed to both create those tools, but also use, use them to drive analysis and policy, policy decisions across the world? Um, and how do we make sure that those people don't just exist in the global north, in San Francisco or London or Berlin or New York, 
but exist where we need them everywhere in the world, driving uh, local decisions informed by their skills and abilities. So those, I think, are the three problems that the pandemic has taught us about data. And I think solving them will really unlock our ability to use data for analysis and, and understanding and, in, as you say in your question, real time, what is happening in the world and being able to act. Uh, final, uh, I will end by uh, giving you a particular program that Data Rogue is working on in this space to make improvements. It's called Epiverse. It's a global collaborative where we brought together many organizations from multiple funders to academic teams to tech companies, working with them to build a suite of open source software tools to do data analysis and also help, help unlock non-traditional sources of data for uh, the, the epidemiological community. So fundamentally how to replace those, that cottage industry of individual bits of software being made across the world with a single set of standardized open tools free to use for everyone. Very closely working with the WHO on this and many other great organizations. Um, so that is one example in how we can as a community come together and begin to put the software, the data in place, and of course the human element, the talent in place to be able to leverage uh, data better. I'll pause there, thank you. Great, thank you very much. That was a great launch to this. So maybe we'll move to Nelson now. I'm Nelson Gonzalez, the head of Global Impact Computing at AWS, and I am creating an interesting new organization that sits between the people who build our products and services, our solutions, and uh, our field teams that work with customers. And we're thinking about the broad trends in different industries and what's needed three to five years from now and anticipating those. And my team looks at social impact as an industry unto its own. And I think that's a, a unique perspective for a large technology company. I'll talk about that uh, perhaps in, in the questions later, but we're really trying to drive technology innovation, particularly around data analytics and compute uh, for social impact. And I wanna respond, Lisa, to your question in, in two parts, a broad one and a narrow one. And the broad one, I think, builds uh, directly on what Daniel mentioned in terms of the, the social and community aspects of what's required here. Obviously, at AWS, we're building a lot of tools, a lot of software, but that doesn't mean that we don't care a lot about the community that, Daniel, you mentioned. Because I think the key here is, as you mentioned in your question, Lisa, population well-being. And we need to design back from the needs of these populations and the challenges that are being faced by those who serve them. We need impact first, or what we sometimes call impact native solutions, not just applications of really powerful, interesting tools and solutions that might be relevant to these areas, but we need to begin with the needs of these population level outcomes, and then see whether and how our tools and methodologies are actually most relevant. And so we're working uh, with uh, organizations like HDSI and data.org in something that isn't often talked about in deeply technical conversations, and that is movement building. And before I get to some very specific examples about what we're doing around technology and tools, I wanna highlight that the opportunity here is actually much larger than building you know, cool new solutions because we're doing that every day. Just like 25 years ago, investors wanting to use the markets to drive social and environmental impact realized that they needed a corollary set of methods, data, and practices that eventually became the field of impact, impact investing. I believe that we're at the genesis of a very similar moment and movement that uses data, analytics, and compute to drive social and environmental outcomes. And that movement, I think, could be called impact computing or something like it. Because like with impact investing, we are engineers, we are data analysts, data scientists, but what we're trying to drive is something that is slightly different, that it's about improving life in whatever form that comes. And like any movement uh, that has been built in, in our societies over time, it requires four things that I think we can all wrap around. Uh, all movements require that we name, connect, nurture, and celebrate the work of pioneers. Uh, what one colleague organization mentioned, the creation of mission engineers. And so I think that's what we can do together. We can name those pioneers and say that you're not as much of an oddball as you think you might be. You're, new, you're a new breed of activists and impact technologists. Number two, we can connect you uh, to Daniel's point about community. You're not alone. Look at all these amazing people attempting to do similar things in many diverse sectors all over the world. And yes, especially in the global South. We can nurture you. This is where I think HDSI is so catalytic in building institutions and supporting them uh, uh, to build uh, opportunities, to develop frameworks, to build capacity, to guide R&D, create impact native data lakes and lake houses and compute stacks, define investment on ramps for private and public investors and impact ROI measurements around what mission engineering or impact computing can do. 
and celebrate these efforts by highlighting and investing in what we're learning from these pioneers. So I think the opportunity here, uh, it certainly involves real-time solutions. And I think it's larger than that. And I think we're at a particular inflection point in history where we can do this. So now to the narrower opportunities. My team is thinking a lot about two things that I want to talk about briefly. One is uh, what I'm calling life in the loop simulations of complex adaptive systems. And the other one is data DE&I. Simulations, uh, digital twins are amazing tools being used to understand and intervene in factories and cities and industrial design, even weather forecasting and climate simulations. But what happens when you throw a person, a community, animals, forests, entire ecosystems into the mix? Living systems at whatever scale create challenges and opportunities for those of us involved in designing new data and compute solutions. And we're currently involved in several efforts related to this, digital twins of economies to help measure progress toward the UN SDGs, um, analytic tools to identify and reduce racial bias and credit instruments with very large financial institutions, real estate titles and regulations and marketing content with uh, some of the most significant marketers uh, in the world. And thinking also about how to apply deep learning and the analytics underneath that to understand how to personalize learning at scale and understand the cognitive processes involved in things like norm setting and behavior change challenges like radicalization and de-radicalization of young people, mask and vaccine adoption uh, trends and environmentally conscious consumer behavior. Uh, we're also doing, in fact, with Harvard Medical School, I can name that here, uh, virtual screening of proteins using high performance computing to radically accelerate drug discovery for rare and hard to treat diseases, and especially cancer. And we're even beginning to use quantum in the data underneath what quantum simulations uh, might require to surface ways to destroy PFAS, the forever chemicals in the, uh, in the environment. And then let me end by talking a little bit about uh, the, the DEI uh, issue here. I think data analytics are a really important part at driving more justice, more equity, more representation. And so we ask ourselves constantly, when does the so-called exogenous need to become endogenous? Why are some variables independent and others not dependent? Might decolonization apply to data sets, heuristics, and analytic methodologies? Well, we think so. And we think that uh, that effort to drive justice into data science and into analytics is a really important part of this movement building. And we see the largest opportunities here in the areas of climate risk and resilience and the social determinants of health. Uh, we are working with the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative to enable the broadest, most diverse open data repository relating to climate. Uh, and we're building what will probably be the world's first full stack analytic capability for the social determinants of health so that we can begin to analyze the 50% of health outcomes that are determined by what some have been perceived as non-clinical. Well, non-clinical is, is, a, is a very uh, subjective uh, definition, right? And so by integrating these into a common framework, we can begin to be more equitable, responsive, and supple in addressing health and well-being. So I think to, if together we can enable pioneers and impact computing and data for good to create proof points around cross-cutting opportunities like life in the loop simulations or complex adaptive systems and, and data DEI, I think hopefully in less than 25 years, we could look back at maybe this moment as the genesis of a new movement that adds engineering as a capstone to the other levers that we've used to drive social and environmental impact. Great, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, okay, we turn to Ashley. Perfect. Um, so when I when I think about how large companies can contribute in this area, um, I think about two things. I think about uh, talent and I think about impact, similar to what Nelson mentioned. Uh, on the talent side, I think we are, you know, collectively sitting on a host of fantastic talent. Our data scientists, engineers, software engineers, and quite honestly, what sets this talent apart is not only that they want to give back to the world, but it actually has become an imperative for this generation and this talent source. Uh, it's a requirement and we should all recognize that this talent group is telling companies we want to give back and it's our obligation to. So I think that puts us in a remarkable spot as a, a global community that we have such an energized uh, talent base to help us on this. The second part is really on, on impact. And um, I, I, I follow in the same lines as, as Nelson does when, you know, it was about maybe five years ago where we took a step back. And at, at that point, um, people were talking about 
artificial intelligence as it could be the doomsday for the human population. There were movies that were coming out that uh, decried that we would be overtaken by AI bots, right? It was, it, it, was, it was a different future and the world got scared. People got scared. They saw it as um, if you looked at automation in the workforce and the potential for reallocation of current jobs, up to 30% of jobs could be uh, replaced with artificial intelligence and data-driven technologies. And so we we thought also as a, as a company that it's our obligation to the world to actually change that narrative and to make it a positive one for social change and to make it a data-driven one that enables uh, this new future positive reality. And we started with impact. How can we have impact on the front lines? And I think um, what I've been really inspired by has been, um, you know, there's all the technology that goes behind it. But at the end of the day, the question is, how can data impact a human life? How could it improve a human life? How can it improve the life of animals, of our environment, um, and, and elsewise? And I think that's um, that's the real tenant that we've had as a, as a company and what was what inspired Noble Intelligence was to say, let us try to work impact back and to make measurable change using data in the lives of real individuals. And that's taken us, I mean, I, I think Daniil has done the same thing with, uh, of course, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, this, is, this is very an inspiring story. Um, where we took as we, we went also to the United Nations SDGs, uh, as I, I know most people are familiar with here, and we started looking at where can we have this impact. And what that led us to are things like, um, you know, protecting or promoting gender equality and promoting, uh, you know, protecting vulnerable populations. And that led us to a, a real focus on combating modern day slavery uh, using data. Uh, if, I, if I just share a narrative on that um, and this connect, why I think this connection to the to the human or to the to the person of the social impact is so important. Um, we worked with a with an NGO that was combating uh, uh, human trafficking, and what I found interesting was that um, and heart wrenching was that you know even when somebody who has been trafficked is rescued, their journey doesn't start stop there. Oftentimes they are reintegrated back into uh, the trafficking situation. They can't actually get positively reintegrated back into society. And so what we helped with that organization was to say, um, okay, taking all the data that you have, over 500,000 paragraphs of case files, um, you know, over 10,000 uh, journeys of survivors of human trafficking, what can we learn leveraging this data to improve the likelihood of their reintegration? Um, and their likelihood to re-enter back into society positively. And so we were able to, uh, using a variety of uh, technologies, natural language processing, uh, journey mapping, et cetera, we were able to find, um, and I'll just give you one example, that if you looked at the likelihood of them to be reintegrated back into society, that just the first engagement, the first service to them, the first contact with the NGO that they had within the first 30 days, increase their likelihood to be reintegrated back into society by threefold. And it didn't matter if it was healthcare, it didn't matter if it was social counseling, et cetera, but that interaction and that start in the journey was actually one of the most important predictive factors. And what that did was it helped to redesign the way that they provided services, not just with that example, but a broader example. It helped to convince the uh, CEO and C-suite level of that organization, that data was something fundamentally to invest in for their organization uh, and to improve the lives of not just 10,000, but the 50 million survivors of human trafficking that they um, aimed to hope to, to support in the coming 10 years. And I use that as a vignette because um, I think that, you know, the more that we as organizations can enable these frontline organizations in, in real practical things that are the, the technology, yes, but then the actual frontline um, change management organization, how do we actually use this data to make significant change in the lives of people? And the more that we can help organizations become data-driven, we will, we will have as a, as, a, as a society much more um, further impact. And I'll stop with that vignette. I know I've, I've, I've talked a lot, but I, I hope um, that story has, has warmed my heart for a long time. And I hope uh, it does the same uh, with you of what we can collectively achieve. Well, it, it is a really powerful story. Um, I just want to say I, I'm more or less blown away by all of your responses. Um, 
Um, they were not exactly what I was expecting. One of the things that I think uh, from my perspective has always been um, that data science is, is about the analytics and not so much about the substance. And I think what you've all mentioned one way or another, whether it's COVID or you know, social determinants of health or actually a story about trafficking um, is that the questions we ask or the data that we have about certain things is really important. And I think often, so often we've been caught sort of flat footed with a lot of data, but for instance, in COVID, we didn't even know um, who was most vulnerable in terms of racial or ethnic um, characteristics or who was at occupational risk because we didn't, we didn't have those answers um, for it. So, so coupled with this, I think we get to a point where actually equity and social movements make a lot more sense. So let me, let me turn to another question. Um, and I don't quite know whether you've all had experience with this, but I suspect you have, certainly Ashley, and you can go first, you have, is um, the question about how can large companies use data to promote not only kind of the corporate bottom line or the business outcomes, but to think about well-being um, and environmental justice and good um, beyond, um, beyond kind of the bottom line. And I'm sure you've all had times where you've actually convinced people um, in corporate positions that this is really important and that they would be better off. I'm curious if you've got examples of that or stories um, to respond to how, how corporations can actually do better. Of course, some of you work for some large corporations too. Um, so Ashley, do you wanna start? And then we'll do Nelson and Daniel. Yeah, indeed. And, and I think, um... You know, again, we're living at a at a unique point in time where the correlation of good business practice and good society practice is coming more to um, uh, to the forefront. I see that uh, because of the talent point that I've that I raised, that it's becoming an imperative for uh, companies. Consumers are making choices based on the value that companies have. So they have an, you know, it's a, it's an inherent crossroads of uh, society and, and consumers are demanding it from businesses. You have more sustainability requirements and ESG. You have a growing amount of decarbonization policies that companies want to adhere to. And so I think you really have the, the juxtaposition now of uh, society being, and, and in a very positive way, being a bit more uh, requiring responsibility uh, and be of that from consumers, shareholders, or the like. And the the crossroads of innovation right now, every company I know has had digital and analytics and, and AI now on the forefront of their CEO agenda for quite some time. And so, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking about a manufacturing company who uh, it knows that they need to reduce their carbon footprint. And the best way to do that is by a robust data-driven analysis of uh, decarbonization opportunities within their plants. It becomes a, 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 you know, a no-brainer, quite honestly. And I think we're, we're seeing that on the, the kind of CEO and C-suite agenda more and more. Great, thanks, that was a great example. Nelson? Uh, yeah, this is a really important question for us because of the nature of my organization. And I think my uh, my strongest sense here is that corporations can do best by mainstreaming social impact. I think philanthropy, supply chain responsibility, ESG, CSR are, are critical. And we need to do more and we need to do better. And I think there's also a corollary motion, which is about making social impact uh, as we've done or experimenting with doing a central component of the heart of the business. We're doing product design, go-to-market strategies, business development, industry engagement strategies for social impact as if though it were any other vertical, right? Any other industry. And I think that is the most respectful way of understanding what social environmental uh, sustainability needs because we can't just have the, the extra, right? We'll, we'll give you a bit of philanthropy. We'll, we'll make sure that our supply chain is a little cleaner. Uh, but, and those things are very serious. We've created the Climate Pledge Fund, the Climate Pledge, we've created that. And now every major company in the world has joined us. Uh, we have the Climate Pledge Fund. We're investing heavily in making sure that we can meet our own Paris Accord agreements 10 years early. 
amazing. Uh, and I think it requires even more. And that's what we're trying to do by driving uh, and mainstreaming uh, social impact as uh, an, an a kind of end state in and of itself for the business, right, at the heart of the business. So I think that's the most important thing for us. Um, a couple other thoughts is that I think it's incredibly, um, uh, there's a lot of potential, it's incredibly potentially fruitful to use the methodology that we've developed to model and understand commute consumer behavior and apply it to non-consumer behavior. Because sure, I, I, I buy things on Amazon once or twice, right? Uh, and my shopping behavior is a small percentage of who I am as a person. I like to learn, I like to play, I like to explore. And the, the fullness of what human identity is or what environmental or other species uh, wellness looks like is, is much more than just uh, uh, sort of consumer behavior. Uh, and so the powerful things that we've created to do that, because that's what many of our businesses are driven on, can and should be applied to things like cognitive domains, to things like uh, norm uh, definition and behavior change uh, for uh, uh, aspects of human uh, behavior and becoming that go well beyond consumer behavior. And then finally, I think it's really important to begin to think about what I sometimes call a good in tech, right? We have tech for good, and that's what most of us are talking about here. But there's an element about turning the gaze inward and saying, what does good in tech look like? And uh, we're exploring things like responsible AI, thinking about measuring carbon footprint, explainability, reliability, and bias, and creating an index around this. What does green machine learning look like? How do we actually um, take responsibility and hold ourselves accountable and with our customers and partners, think about uh, the implication, particularly around things like NFTs and, 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 and uh, um, crypto and, and the kind of carbon footprint there. How do we take responsibility for that by thinking about greener uh, machine learning models? Um, responsibility and trust and autonomy is huge, right? How do we build frameworks through which we can begin to understand what autonomous systems need to be? How do we encode responsibility, trustworthiness, right, into the systems that are going to manage not just autonomous vehicles, but autonomous everything, right? Um, and then finally, uh, around quantum, we care a lot about access, global south access. How do we ensure that quantum doesn't become yet another variable in the digital data divide? It could very well be we can actually intervene right now to actually change uh, the trajectory there. So I think those are the ways that we're you know, experimenting with others at, at trying to bring uh, the gaze inward and make sure that we uh, do good with our technology and not just through it. Very helpful. That's really insightful. Daniel? So I'm um, uh, 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 echoing a lot of what my uh, uh, peers on the panel have said already. Uh, this is a very interesting moment where corporations are seeing um, their, is their responsibilities in terms of ESG, not just, I think, as Nelson just said, as an add-on or an extra, but as core to their uh, DNA and core to their success in the future, core to attracting customers and retaining them. And um, in data.org, of course, we are not a corporation, we're a nonprofit, but we are certainly um, seeing the same from the outside in, and we're using that, um, that momentum. So one of the things we're doing as a, as a platform of partnerships is we are connecting people in academia, in social impact organizations, nonprofits, with uh, you know, colleagues in big tech companies. We worked, for example, with Nelson's team, we worked with Microsoft, with Google, connecting them with social impact organizations where they need assistance, uh, whether it is, you know, um, compute credits or whether it is actual technical know-how that great engineers in those um, organizations can bring to a project. Um, and so, the, so we're seeing that, um, that kind of behavior uh, as a very positive development. And the social impact sector needs all the help that, that, that it's possible to, to get. They themselves find it very difficult to compete for tech talent in, in the open marketplace. Because of course, the, 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 the flip side of this is that at the moment, a lot of the talent is going to, to, to the big tech corporations. Therefore, the social impact sector is, is feeling left behind. So how, how do we begin to A, reverse that? Is a big question that plays on my mind, but also how do, how do our partners in the big tech recognizing that that's a reality of the marketplace at the moment can unlock their ESG, um, if you like, um, credits and give the, 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 the uh, resource time from the great engineers, designers, product managers to, to uh, great projects uh, working with social impact organizations. And as they're all, we're trying to unlock it. I'll give you a couple of examples. We've launched about a year ago, our inclusive growth and recovery challenge. It was a 10 million call um, challenge call to social impact organizations from across the world 
we had about 1200 applicants and, and we were only able to fund, give funding to eight. So huge attrition rate from 12, uh, 1200 to eight. Um, but many of the ones who didn't get our funding, we were still able to help by connecting them with our partners in, 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 tech, in tech companies and basically unlocking uh, in-kind resources and in-kind help. So that I think is, is a great example how, how, how this, this can work in the future. Um, and to speak a little bit uh, to Nelson's idea of this tech for good, there is good in tech. I'll, I'll give you an example from my previous job when I was head of Welcome Data Labs. Uh, so Welcome is not a private corporation, it's a huge philanthropy, but it's a philanthropy of the scale that it behaves often like a big corporation, it has the same kind of if you like gravitational pull. It, it gives over uh, $1.3 billion or more a year in scientific funding. So one of the biggest funders, um, private funders of health, for example. So within that kind of size, comes huge responsibilities. So I remember as head of data labs there, one of the things I was talking to my board about was we need to act responsibly and take, take account of, of, that, of the gravitational pull of the organization. And for example, look at how we can help people use our data better. Look at how we can um, make sure that the grants data that we work with, uh, we, give out, we give out thousands of grants a year, how that data can be made available. Um, so we created tools, free to use open source tools for other organizations to be able to query the data and, uh, and analyze it. We also, in terms of really getting at the nub of good in tech, to use Nelson's great uh, framing, we actually also involved a number of social scientists to work out what is the ethical methodology in, in, in how we do that that work and how we make those decisions. Like how, how do you decide which data to release first, who gets to access which data, et cetera. So we involved um, in a kind of innovative way, built up an interdisciplinary team and involved some ethicists and social scientists who worked with our tech product teams um, and basically challenged them in a, in a positive way to ask questions of why and what happens if, and have you considered the consequences of this or that or the other, which was um, a hugely important innovation for us. And I think that is what big companies need to do. They need to take uh, be aware of their power in, in the field and, and innovate in this ethical way to, if you like, both hold themselves to account uh, internally and externally in how they use tech. This is really helpful. It actually makes me want to dig a little bit deeper. So um, let, let me push this just a little bit farther and think that, you know, in some ways I feel like there was enormous resistance to this sort of um, activity in the past. And it seems like we're at this kind of turning point where um, actually big companies, let's say whether they're actually nonprofit foundations in the case of Welcome or you know, for-profit companies are at this turning point from resistance to kind of seeing, seeing the good in it. And I wonder if you have like these transition stories. Like I, I think about like when I go into a work site, there's a point at which I think, oh, I've just changed the CEO's mind. Like they went in this way and they're coming out that way. And I just wonder whether you have those kind of stories and maybe Nelson, you wanna take a stab and then, and then anybody or we'll, we'll keep on going. But I, I'm really curious how this kind of change happens and what your experiences are sort of personally in this way. I, I, and I keep bringing back the nature of, of our organization, not because we're doing it all right, but because it's really an experiment in this, in this mm -hmm. transition point that you mentioned. And I think for, for me in a, in a go-to-market business development uh, kind of role, and again, thinking about social impact as an industry of industries unto itself that needs to be served with the same kind mm -hmm. of rigor and sophistication that you know, any other industry should be uh, served with. Um, we've had to think a lot about the return on investment argument. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the inflection point and, and the jujitsu that we've done around that is to demonstrate that this is a, the long-term play here is, is it is triple bottom line, you know, profit, planet mm -hmm. and, and people and rigorously so. And um, Amazon, like many large companies is incredibly rigorous. And so the kinds of justifications that we have to make for our investments when they're not philanthropy, when they're not mm -hmm. uh, removed from the central logic of the company is, is quite intense, particularly when you're uh, trying to argue for something that is relatively net new. And so thinking about the uh, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary effects of investing, of mainstreaming social impact um, has been really critical to help people understand why 
uh, you know, a, a publicly traded uh, company with uh, shareholder obligations um, should be seeing social impact as a sector onto itself. And it's because it does make a lot of uh, uh, sense for the bottom line. It really does. It actually, it pays to do this because there is massive <laughs> spending in health and education and the environment and justice and, and learning and all of these areas. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, I don't think we've yet been rigorously obsessed with the needs of those customers. We haven't designed backward rigorously from those needs and invented and simplified uh, solutions that speak directly to impact first, impact native uh, kinds of spaces. Doing that unlocks incredible, I think, purchasing power. And by doing that, we enable a movement, right? <laughs> Which is what yes. we're actually trying to do here. So um, look, it's not neat. Uh, are, there, are there tensions? Absolutely. Uh, are there the logics of the sectors that are, sometimes are in conflict? Sure, it can be a Tower of Babel. But I think a lot of um, the, uh, the work here is to translate uh, between these logics and understandings of time, return, data, accountability, uh, and so forth, and, and to draw uh, where things are actually more aligned than um, than they have been. And I think post-COVID, well, not post-COVID, but in COVID, uh, in the middle of the environmental crisis that we're in, in the middle of the political, social, cultural crises that we're in, um, there's now, I think, an openness for these uh, this translation among the sectors and this logic to be brought to bear. And so uh, that's those are the inflection points that we're in the middle of. Uh, and, and it needs to be done with rigor, appropriately so, but we're finding um, a, a lot of traction, not because um, my company happens to be any more uh, you know, humanitarian than any other, but because um, in this moment, I think the logic is there. And that's why I think it is a movement building moment because we can actually squeeze through this ability to make sense of this in a way that perhaps um, hasn't been as easy in the past. All right, thanks, that's super helpful. Ashley, do you have stories? <laughs> Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a broken record here, right? It's 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 people and and value, um, and I think on the people side, um, I, there does come a moment where companies who are trying to innovate look at their talent retention and they start wondering why their talent is moving in mass uh, away. And I think as as probably many of you know, there is quite a, a, a combat for talent or a, a, a goal to source the best talent at the moment. And um, it, 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 so it becomes an imperative. Um, and I, I've seen a, a few companies where it, it actually came from, uh, you know, the, the, the data side of HR that this became an imperative. And I've also seen the very, the very fact-based business case. So we've um, done analyses that have shown, de depending on which type of industry you're in, the impact of becoming a data organization will have between a 15 to a 40 plus percent improvement on your bottom line EBITDA. And I think that is just figures that, um, that are, that are uh, you know, not possible to, uh, to ignore. Um, and particularly when you look at the, the um, the, the rise and fall of the digital laggards, let's say, um, when we went through the digital transformation not 10 years ago, we are seeing the same thing with the data-driven and AI-enabled um, uh, transformation now. So I, 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 I've seen, you know, I, maybe you can't say it's been the aha moment, but it's been the moment where the frog gets a little bit too hot in the water and jumps out. <laughs> this had definitely happened uh, quite a few times. That's great. That's great. Daniel? What I would, would add, I think, is um, the point about sustain, sustaining the momentum. I mm -hmm. think it's really good to hear my, my peers talk about the kind of the embedding of this culture, that it's not just, it's not just uh, an add-on to what they do, but, but they're seeing it as, as a route to profit, as a route to profitability. Uh, Nelson's case as, as a route to retain and attract great talent, as Ashley just mentioned. I think when, when corporations start seeing it that way as, as like fundamental to their success in the future, I think we get to sustainability. Uh, and and that, is, that is hugely important because the previous phase was, was you know, had as many problems as solutions. So I, I would call there was a lot of, in, in the old days, um, ethics washing where organizations would go in and contribute uh, a bit of tech support, but because they do it uh, as a one-off, the, the social impact organizations who are taking that support are then uh, ending up either locked into a certain technology or um, uh, lacking funding for the long-term. Um, 
I think a far better way of doing it would be to see it as a long-term partnership between the corporate sector and the social impact sector, because it is in the corporate se uh, sector's uh, actual interest to do so. So I think that kind of approach is much better. And I'm really, really glad to hear it from Nelson and Ashley. And I'm certainly seeing the same from, from the external perspective that we have when we work with, uh, with many of our corporate partners. Yeah, I think this is very helpful. It sort of points to this idea of a triple bottom line or the spillover that happens. Um, and it's not just, you know, charity or philanthropy that just gives a, something away for a moment without understanding the deeper kind of embeddedness of this. So um, all of you have, have some contacts with universities, but I'm really wondering, especially since we're at a university, um, if there are ways that we could collaborate better um, or ways that you wished we could, um, I had originally thought, like evaluate social and economic policies. Like how do we know if something's working um, that isn't of our doing at all? You know, the government decides on a policy, it decides on another policy, um, or, you know, a corp company decides on a policy. So what do you, what do you think about, about the kind of future of university and um, your, your interests, kind of collaborations and, and opportunities that we could have to really have an impact in terms of evaluating policies. And maybe, um, let's see, why don't we actually, Daniel, go back to you and then we'll go the other way again. Sure, happy to. Um, so one of the things we do at data.org is, is, is try to build connections across those kind of sectoral divides. So how do we connect great academic partners with uh, philanthropy or with social impact organizations or indeed with corporate uh, organizations? The reason we think it's very valuable because to solve some of the biggest problems that face us, pandemic I, I mentioned before, climate uh, is, is another one. Those problems are really complex. They, 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 they're not susceptible to an easy solution. You can't create an app to fix it. Um, so they require an interdisciplinary approach. And each of those uh, sectors brings something to the table. So academia brings to the table deep subject matter expertise. And that's usually important. Um, in applying data science wisely, asking the right questions, choosing the right data sets, make sure you, you, you making sure you um, understand that you know the data approach on health data is not the same as on financial data. Uh, in one geography, the legal constraints are not the same as in another geography. So having subject expertise from academia um, to data projects is, is usually important. I'll give you an example how it doesn't work when you don't have it. So, so um, the Turing Institute in the UK did a, did a, a review of uh, more than 100 um, AI interventions from the corporate sector um, on trying to diagnose COVID-19. And they found that, that almost all of them were ineffective. They did not work fundamentally, uh, despite all the, all the best intentions and, and good, good, good effort. Uh, the reason is when they analyzed. In most cases, those projects were either tech-led with not enough surgical expertise from doctors and public health officials, or the other way around. They, they were created from within the, the, the health space without good tech expertise. So that gives you an example. If you don't have the skills, the subject matter expertise from academia, the great tech knowledge uh, um, from the tech sector, you, you're missing things. And some of the biggest challenges we have require interdisciplinary approaches and require those things to all be present. And, I, and just, just to end on, on interdisciplinarity, we need to acknowledge it is not easy to be in truly interdisciplinary. It's not easy to blend skills and it takes time and effort. Um, so uh, the example I mentioned in my prior answer on, on Welcome Data Labs, it took us probably about two years in that team to integrate the social scientists uh, effectively into the tech product uh, agile life cycles because they they work to different rhythms and tempos. They weren't used to us uh, uh, to work to work in that particular way. They also spoke different languages. I, uh, part of the effort is is just creating a shared language. So interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity, I think, is key, but it takes time and it takes effort. And and all of us need to, if you like, make sure we build those muscles in order to to uh, answer those big questions. I'll yeah, pause there. I think that's spot on. Um, and all of us work in this area, I guess. Ashley? Yeah, um, uh, you know, plus one to everything Danil said. And I would also maybe um, add to that, 
There is a notion around the policy mention that you, the uh, policy point that you mentioned, Lisa, and also around uh, responsible AI trust interpret interpretability. Um, I think that academia uh, on the policy point, quite honestly, you know, NGOs, yes, but not many uh, organizations and corporations are really addressing policy per se. They're coming at it from a technology standpoint. They're coming at it from an end user standpoint. Um, so I think that the real uh, foundation of the, the policy guidance and the policy research is really coming from academia and will continue to do so. So that will be a, an incredibly important uh, driver for that. And I also think that the um, you know, somebody who can, from an external perspective, put out ideas around what is responsible AI? What, you know, how do you develop trust in the system? What are the, you know, are, tr are the data sets that are being used, um, you know, can, can we help to investigate whether they are, you know, whether they have bias inherent in those training systems. So I've seen a lot of really interesting collaborations, ourselves included, where we said, listen, we want an external partner because if we're doing something for um, a client, uh, we believe it is so fundamentally important to check rigorously any inherent bias in the system, any inherent uh, uh, trust or interpretability issues we may have. And we have actually um, uh, worked with uh, quite a few academic organizations to say, please come in and check our check what we're doing because you guys have the best approaches to do that. And I think this will also be a fundamental role of academia going forward. Great, that was very, very helpful. And actually leads into the next question. So I wonder if we could, Ask Nelson if I could ask you both to respond to that and think in the last few minutes that we have before we open it for questions, like what are the, the risks and the dangers that are inherent in this? Um, you know, what's your, what's your scariest moment when you think of how this could go awry? Mm. Yeah, I'll answer that and integrate some of the, the cross-sector uh, questions of the previous one, because I think one of the, the biggest worries is that we'll build solutions and, and services um, on top of faulty logic, particularly when we're thinking about this impact native, impact first mandate, right? Um, this isn't just complex simulation, it's life from the loop complex simulation. This isn't just data analytics, it's, it's, it's equitable, inclusive, uh, diverse data analytics. And so we need uh, partners like the Harvard Data Science Initiative and others to really help us with the methodologies to help us do things like good causal inference. Uh, how do we do multi-everything analysis, right? Multimodal, multi-entity, multilingual, locale, multitasker presentation learning. All of these are really important if we're, get, if we're gonna get to the complexity underneath you know, modeling life. Uh, Agent-based modeling is a, a massive need to really push forward on that so that we get to more supple simulations. So um, I think a, a, a big nightmare would be that we build something that uh, assumes that you know, life in the loop uh, would operate just like any other complex system when that's not true. Um, and we end up not serving our customers. Um, so I think that's a, a real issue. I think the other major uh, concern, obviously, for, for large corporations as well is the trust issue. Uh, building trust is one of our core learning principles at, at, at Amazon. And we take that very seriously in everything we do. How do we build trust? Um, and I think particularly the, the nonprofit sector, public, public sector has a huge role to play. I and think about you know governance mechanisms that need to be put in place if the movement that we're talking about is going to be catalyzed. Uh, you know, I often wonder whether I can like governance uh, instruments that you know control naming conventions in the internet. And it worked quite well as a kind of quango, I guess, as the British say, a kind of interstitial, intersector kind of body that still has the public benefit in mind and can still understand the logics of the different sectors. Um, building data trusts, right? We I talked about data lakes, lake house formation motions as really critical to underpinning some of the promise of data science for social impact. But how do we build you know, the trust component, not just the, the, the fancy lake house components around that uh, really important question. We're experimenting with that at the Amazon Data Exchange, trying to figure out different mechanisms from everything from open data to highly, highly classified data, from free data to monetized data owned by very different kinds of actors. Um, that's real life right now. And I think uh, in order to avoid some of these nightmare scenarios, we need to have a ton of empathy for one another 
and I think be good partners by really understanding what does it take for Daniel to win, you know, for Ashley to win. We have very, or, or for my colleagues at HDSI to win, we have very different logics and timelines and data sets, right? Uh, David and Francesca are in a timeline to win their Nobel. Uh, that's going to take a while. Uh, you as well, Lisa. Um, you know, we have quarterly returns and, you know, Ashley maybe has other incentives and Daniel's, uh, you know, trying to maintain a sustainable nonprofit. The way we look at capital and reporting to our boards and thinking about language and data and, and what counts as good enough, incredibly different. So if I'm going to partner with Daniel, I need to understand how to make him win in front of his board. And hopefully he'll help me win in, you know, in front of uh, the people to whom I report. And I think really understanding the, the logics of the sectors and their complementarity and tensions is really critical to understanding the promise of this moment. And the nightmare scenario is that we don't do that. And therefore we don't build the trust uh, and don't ever get to building the right kind of core methodologies that help us with things like causal inference for intervention and complex modeling for better policy design. Great, thank you. So Daniel? I'll, I'll add two, two, two things to this. Um, one is about how do we engage in true co-design with those people, those communities who are affected by our data tools, data decisions? Um, I think that's really important to what Data.org is doing. Um, and I think to all the efforts that all of us have described today. So, so for example, in, in, in the domain of health that, that the FOS program is operating in, how do those teams uh, actually engage communities on the ground who will be uh, both using the tools, but also affected by the results, the decisions made by the tools, the policy decisions made um, when we talk about uh, building policy of data. So I think co-design with communities is really important to us. To, to make that a reality, co-design happens most effectively if, it, if there is capacity and ecosystem built on the ground. So uh, you need to invest in... Um, in the creation of tools, the creation of technology, uh, where the problem persists, which is why in, in, in the Upverse program, we funded great universities in uh, Colombia um, uh, that Nelson knows about. So University Javeriana, uh, Universidad de los Andes, we have a great team in MSC Gambia, um, and they are building the tools. So we're kind of inverting the usual dimensions of saying software is built um, you know, somewhere in Europe or America and then deployed. Uh, in other parts of the world. We wanted to do it the other way around. Software is built where it will be used, co-designed with the communities affected. And that is both more equitable, but more importantly, or equally as importantly, it's also more effective. You build better software tools in that way. So I think it's really important. That's, uh, that's what one point I, I would put in. The second one is, um, and I think Nelson's answer was, was fascinating because I think it's, it's, it's speaking to the same thing. Um, it, it's about rhythm. So there's, there's a lot of conversations at the moment in, in the tech for goods and data for good space about slowing down AI innovation. And I think it's really important that there are certain sectors, certain classes of AI that you do want as a society to, to just take a step back and slow down. Surveillance, uh, personal surveillance and justice system is one example. There are real harms that we've built in through biased data sets, through kind of teams who are um, potentially, potentially rushing ahead to deploy solutions which are, which are, which are harmful. On the other hand, in other sectors, you need to speed up. Like the use of, of uh, data in the pandemic, as I said uh, uh, right at the beginning, it used to, be, used to take two years to analyze data from clinical trials. We squeezed it down to weeks uh, when we were testing vaccines for COVID-19 mm -hmm. because we had a need. And the same need applies in many other health contexts. So we really need to speed up innovation in there. So fundamentally, it's not just about slowing down everything or speeding up everything. It's about rhythm. Um, you need to find the right speed for the right context and understand the harms caused and therefore you slow down in those contexts on, or understand the unserved need and you speed up in those contexts. So that, that, that's an important perspective on, on the whole aspect of, of kind of responsible AI, responsible data science. That's very helpful. And Ashley, and then we will turn it to the audience for some questions. Yeah, um, um, I think a lot of the, the main points that we've discussed here, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, trust, interoperability, and um, and bias. And I think those are the main things that we need to watch out for. I do appreciate that some of the choices can be um, unintended 
and you know so for instance i think two two times that we've come up against this one was uh in trying to um think about how we develop uh how we develop a damage assessment uh, tools using satellite, telecom, uh, geospatial data and the like. And ideally in, in, a, in, a, in a world, we wanna make all those open source. But if you can imagine, and you can think about things, the same type of drone technology, those types of technology can also be used for nefarious purposes, particularly if it falls in the hands of, you know, not the right people. And if we, if we hold ourselves to kind of the open source um, ideal that we would like to have, there, there are some real challenges with that. So I think that's one thing that we, we've had to have a, a sharp line on. The other one, which is uh, not as often talked about, but is really informing organizations on interpretability and what is responsible interpretability. And I, I bring back that, that idea of um, helping uh, one of these NGOs in, in anti-human trafficking because um, there, what we had was data quality was not always the best. We had this, you know, quite often, um, but you're still trying to make the best sense of it. And in that instance, uh, you know, in some of the model interpretability we had, the confidence, you know, could be interpreted different ways. It was not as high as we would like. And we had to challenge ourselves to say, okay, well, um, you know, in the positive form, <laughs> How do we want to interpret this? In the positive form, if we say that this service was beneficial to the survivor and we provide them a service based on that data interpretability, that could be okay. But what if our model was wrong? And what if we're taking away a service that was really impactful and important to their reintegration into society? And now we've removed it because of poor interpretability on our part. And I think you know that was kind of a switch for me when I said, um, you, you know, our, our, our idea in that case was, okay, we can add it, but we actually can't at this point take anything away because of interpretability. And I think that's a fundamental thing that we don't talk enough about because many people are using this on the front line, people who are not thoroughly aware of how to interpret um, data and interpret these algorithms, but actually the choices are quite significant. So I think that we need to have more of an open conversation around what responsible interpretability is. Thank you. This was this was really fascinating, um, and I think both the upside, the idea, and the importance of you know building trust of doing multidisciplinary work takes effort. It's like deeply challenging and takes time. And the ideas of co-design have come up and up again. And I think you know the other um, sort of downsides of the bias that we inherently build in that is unintentional um, in my work there are constantly unintended consequences, things that I was sure we were doing for the, for the good that turned out um, to have really unintended negative consequences or policies that we thought were really beneficial, designed to be beneficial that had unintended consequences. So that, that ability to be self-reflective as we walk through this um, time is, is I just think very essential. So it's good to hear all of you um, sort of grounded in that way. So I think we'll um, turn it back um, to the questions and Francesca, should I look at the questions or do you wanna lead Please off or should we do this? Please look at the question and out question. Okay. And feel free and let me know if you need any help. Okay, terrific. So um, I will just, I think start from maybe the top um, and this is from Alexandra Sueva who says, um, could Daniel please repeat the name of the epidemiologic collaborative tool that they developed with WHO? That was an easy one, I think. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. So um, the program is called Epiverse. It's a whole suite of tools rather than just one tool. And we're collaborating with WHO, but in how very closely, but also other partners, um, you know, from the Rockefeller Foundation to the Wellcome Trust to the CDC, etc. So uh, Epiverse is the is the name of the program and the suite of tools. Great, thanks. And Tarek has a question. Who do you think should be in control of moderating data online post digital comment? This is a timely one. Um, should it be the government, the private sector or some other entity? And to what extent do you think open sourcing social media algorithms could help better manage online content. I mean, this is this is in parentheses and you know an Elon Musk question. 
I think anybody can take these now. Just we'll try to hear from a range. You don't all have to answer all of them. Well, I, I, I can, I can um, have a first stab and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask my, my, my colleagues on the panel to, to back me up and uh, come in as well. So obviously the context of it is, is Twitter and Elon Musk and, uh, and the, the wider problem of moderation. Uh, I, mean, I mean, we've lived through such a period um, of misinformation online, uh, of, of actual harms being caused by many social media channels. And I think what we've realized is, and belatedly realized, is to what extent these channels, these platforms are our public square, that they are where uh, a lot of us are living a, a big significant chunks of our lives. And fundamentally we've left that public square um, without sufficient regulation and, and often without, um, without even kind of considering the effects when it was being built. Uh, it's, it, 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 a couple of years ago, there was a, there was a whole run of ex executives from, uh, from uh, Facebook um, who have since left the company, you know, saying, oh, oh you know, I wish I thought about, uh, I thought more carefully about doing X, Y, or Z. Um, so what does it tell us? It tells us that, that we need to uh, think ahead and ask the why questions. Should we do this? What would happen if questions? Um, as we uh, build platforms, and this, this now broadens from social media to other data platforms. Um, so uh, one way, one, one kind of control I would put in place is let's um, reimagine what, who gets to ask those questions in the first place. Let's broaden that dialogue. So we have uh, both good um, oversight from uh, public democratically elected officials and um, we have great participation from communities going back to the co-design point. And we even, even broaden how tax work in the first place. That's the, that, that goes back to the idea of interdisciplinarity I mentioned earlier. So basically we need at all levels, at government level, at community co-design level, at the way that tax make decisions. And I really like the point uh, Ashley made about responsible inter uh, uh, interpretability because data scientists often make uh, really micro decisions which have huge effects like where do you put a threshold what what is counted as a false positive or false negative can have an effect on how an algorithm makes important decisions so um so so i guess recognizing that this is our public square recognizing it's an important part of our society and then beginning those interventions thoughtful interventions about how we design these spaces how we regulate them would be would be the beginning of an answer. Great. Does anybody else want to take a stab at that? Okay, we'll keep we'll keep moving along. Um, so Rebecca uh, McCoy, both David and Nelson mentioned the importance and ongoing efforts of creating new lake house and data uh, repositories. The problem is that now even major corporate organization has its own repository or every, I guess, major corporate organization has its own repository. How do we coordinate efforts? I can start. Um, so I think you know, obviously a lot of the data that we're talking about here is open data, not all of it. And so that there, there are ways of clearly creating linkages there that um, aren't necessarily going to be impeded by the, uh, the fact that uh, like different lake houses are owned by different companies. And so I think there's a really important open data conversation. Dallas organization is leading that. We have an open data initiative uh, at, at Amazon, obviously, that uh, is trying to facilitate a lot of this. So I think that's one answer. How can we make that more and more robust? Um, another uh, way I think of, of beginning to address this is through this data trust um, notion that I mentioned earlier. There are several nonprofit organizations trying to do just this, to create um, not just the technical, but the, the business outcome and governance mechanisms through which this kind of data sharing uh, can be done. I think it'd be, I would be, love to be in a conversation about how we as, at AWS could participate in a data trust that involved others for the common good, right? Could there be some mechanisms through which we can uh, share data, have even 
our Amazon data exchange, where, as I said, a lot of data isn't open. Some of it is highly classified, some of it is monetized. But are there, are there uh, rubrics, are there um, uh, methodologies through which we could collaborate toward you know, a common good um, by creating these data trusts? And this is why I mentioned you know, the, the real governance question. This is not a technology question. This is a governance question, right? And that's why I brought up the ICANN example, right? Very beginning of the internet, we knew we had to come up with entirely new frameworks for governing this thing. Uh, we need to do that around things like data lakes and lake houses. Um, and so I think that's a question to others. Uh, you know, uh, luckily we at Amazon are just, we're just plumbing. Uh, so we'll do whatever um, is useful from that plumbing perspective. But, you know, our plumbing isn't going to be very helpful if it's not porting into something that have a, has a really good rigorous governance uh, and a data trust um, strategy behind it. So I think this is very important work that um, nonprofits, policy makers, and, and places like HDSI could definitely lean in on to create some ex governance experiments where companies like ours would be happy to participate and see whether it works or not, you know, and how, how to tweak that. Great. Great. And I have to admit that before today, I always thought a lake house was a lake house. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I know better. <laughs> um, so here's a question maybe, um, Ashley, you want to take a stab, which is about coordinating large data sets. So all these businesses now have these huge data sets and maintaining them. How do we know that they're, um, or what approaches and techniques do we have in validating the data across these business outcomes? Yeah, and I, I, I must say this is probably one of the largest challenges I see organizations go through. Um, it, it's the classic, you know, if we build it, if we build all the data, the outcomes will come uh, perspective. Um, and I, I remember I was actually working um, for one healthcare client in, in a similar perspective where uh, the goal was, well, let's create the massive data universe with clinical data, with uh, epidemiological data, with outcomes data. It's, you know, all of their kind of R&D data was going to be focused uh, in here. And they worked on that for about three years. And at the end of that big, massive three-year um, perspective, they turned around and said, well, what are you going to do with it now? And uh, they looked at the over 16,000 data fields that they had structured, that they had uh, collated. And at the end, when they took their top 10 actual use cases, they wanted to, uh, that they, bought, they thought would bring the most business uh, outcomes and impact it turned out that less than a thousand fields were actually needed for that. And I, I, I share that from a perspective of um, things, data should be business back uh, as much as possible. There is of course advantages to building it in the future. And, and but, I, but I also think that for most companies, the focusing on the business outcomes and then going back or the types of solutions you want to build and then going data back is, is, is the most valid way of, um, of, of, of approaching that perspective. Very helpful. It reminds me of electronic medical records. We will see yeah. you know, yeah. how, far, how far that goes and extending beyond that. So um, here's a question. Um, Really, um, it's for students interested in data and driving social impact with data. What are some of the career academic paths you would suggest, basically given the data that data scientist roles at big tech oftentimes center around analytics and business decision-making? What, what are the opportunities? I suspect there are opportunities in each of your three organizations, but probably much more broadly than that. I'm also happy to go. I, I would say um, go with uh, go with what your passion is. Right now, uh, right now, data science is 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 not a limiting factor in, in most companies. I think many companies are um, re really much uh, seeking for this type of of talent. And if your focus is driving social impact with data, you can do that a number of ways. I know that there, and I, I think you need to do, you know, a little bit of honest self-reflection for what you want. I've seen um, people come, students, a lot of our, um, a lot of our, my colleagues and talent are coming directly out of university, and they also want this uh, similar perspective. And I'll tell you the three journeys I see them take. I see one journey that says, um, I really want to focus on only social impact. 
and they want to go work for yes. a, a, an NGO, perhaps that is starting in this space, or they want to go, uh, uh, you know, work for another area where they can make that their single focus and mission. Um, sometimes they love it. I think sometimes also I've seen, you know, pace and change can sometimes be slower in those areas, or they may feel like they're the only data scientist brought into an NGO and or a, a, a new uh, new organization to just not an NGO, but a new organization, new corporation, new to data science, and it can feel lonely. So I think that's that's actually a trade off you 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 need to think about and make. I've seen a second route, which is um, I'm you know I'm going to uh, do uh, some I'm going to work on a, a different company um, in a in a business, and I'm going to actually do data science on the side. Maybe it's through um, NGOs uh, like um, some of the organizations we've talked to today, or uh, Danil's organization. Maybe it's organizations like Data Kind. I think has always been a great outlet for that. But there are lots of opportunities to support on the side. And then I've seen a third option, which is come revolutionize a company, right? Our, if I think about our own reflection of my, my own company, um, Noble Intelligence was started from people like you, from people like me that just said, this is something we have to do. And, um, and I wanna commit a significant part of my time through rotations, through, um, but in my company, I wanna actually uh, be an entrepreneur and, and start that up. So I think you have, three very, very solid, there's probably others, um, but three very solid uh, aspects to get involved. That's terrific. That's a great answer. So I'll, Francesca, um, oh, didn't, go ahead. I, I, I want to give a complimentary answer, uh, uh, and I'm obviously very biased coming from a place like AWS, but I'll, I'll just say from our perspective, data science, data analytics, and, and I'll add machine learning are table stakes. And so if you want to have impact in uh, in, in, in social environmental issues and use technology, um, they are table stakes. Now, how, how deeply you need to go, how far you need to go, obviously, I totally agree with Ashley, depends on your passion. Um, but increasingly, and I think in all sectors, right, simulation and modeling for policy, Daniel was speaking about his talent gaps, right, that he's seeing in the nonprofit sector, and certainly at places like AWS, I think across all of those sectors, um, the, the table stakes is data science and machine learning. From there, it's incredibly important that we have multidisciplinary, very diverse candidates who understand the humanities, who understand public policy. Um, my chief uh, solutions architect is also a poet, right? Uh, we need that kind of perspective. But again, my biased perspective, uh, data science and ML, uh, table stakes, and you build from there without those. Um, not only, I think, is it hard to add value to the current conversation, but maybe even more importantly, uh, one would not be teed up to, for example, take advantage of quantum, right? The next frontier, which we, is going to become, would come online through applications imminently. And so it's, it's about using those things today, but also preparing yourselves to be on, on, on the forefront of what's next. And if, if I if I round us up on, on this question, because I think it's a really key one, how, how, how we onboard new talent, um, there was, uh, I think, a, a problematic approach by many governments not so long ago, who having realized that, you know, data skills, the kind of skills that Nelson just mentioned, actually, are really important to the future of, of the uh, of the job sector, I basically said, great, let's invest all our money in STEM subjects, computing, maths at school, and uh, what we saw is, is the beginning of removing humanities, social sciences, art courses. Now, I think that's the wrong approach for the reason that Nelson just mentioned. Yes, you need the, the technical skills uh, there as a foundation, but the real value is added with the extra skills that come on top. So we need our young people at schools, at universities, yes, learning computer science, but also learning anthropology and sociology and becoming poets, because that's the only way where we, we, we get a proper unlocking of the potential of data when we combine the technical skills, which are fun foundational with the, if you like the broader skills, which uh, allow us to ask the right questions in the first place. Terrific. So Francesca has um, asked a question that we have in part answered, at least Ashley has, but maybe Nelson and Daniel, you can. In the context of data for social impact, should we start with the question and the impact we want to achieve and then collect the best possible data and develop the best possible tool? Or should we first build the largest possible data repository and the best possible tools and then see what we can achieve? What are the pros and cons of these uh, frameworks? 
Yeah, I would, Francesca, I would say both and, uh, not to be annoying, but because um, <laughs> I think that my intuition would be the former to understand the problem, design backward from that, and be very precise about what data we collect, what the analytical methods might be to, to uh, make sense of that data. However, uh, sitting in AWS, I've seen the power, right, of, of the lake house formation um, logic and the, the creation of a space in which you just bring it all in, right, structured, unstructured, uh, all kinds of data, because one doesn't know the questions that will surface when you get precise, right? So when you begin to, to define the experiment and look at the variables and exogenous and endogenous and dependent and independent, then all sorts of other questions emerge, right? The unanticipated um, data needs. And having that lake, right, uh, to depend on is going to accelerate the more precise surgical analysis. I think beginning with the surgical analysis and then working backward, I think could uh, probably uh, slow down uh, research and innovation. And so um, even though I, I love the precision of, of the former, um, increasingly I'm seeing the utility of the latter. And therefore I think uh, doing them in parallel uh, is probably wise because I, I don't know that in doing them in parallel has um, I don't know that there's lost investment in that, whereas doing one or the other, there could be unintended consequences, I think, much more easily than, than working in parallel. And I, I would agree with Nelson on that. Um, to, give, to give a concrete example um, of, of the pandemic, again, uh, from our focus over the last couple of years, we had good examples of both working powerfully. So an example of a focus intervention, um, you know, analyzing clinical trial data, you, you construct the questions, you construct the trials um, in a very precise way, um, collect the data in a very precise way to get results fast. On the other hand, the, the way we found out in the first place that there's a problem in, in, uh, in China and in Wuhan was from often doctors in the emergency rooms sharing information on Sina Weibo, which is kind of the version of, on, on, of Twitter in China. And that is the is, is example of, of Analyzing data in, in, a, in a generic large large data data source um, and finding a pattern that's there, and that pattern is showing us that something is happening in Wuhan, and that uh, it, uh, causes us to look at it more, more closely. So I think that both are important in different contexts. Great. So those are good answers. Um, so we have a question from Sean Kurth that AI adopted and equity and equity are hindered are hindered by data deserts in some of our most fragile countries and communities around the world. There can be cultural resistance to trust AI, and we know culture trumps strategic behavior, trumps logic, et cetera. How do we create a scalable connected data while working across massively different cultures? And how can this be done and structured? I also think that this should be probably the last question as we're running okay. out. Um, I'll, I'll start just because I love this question. Thank you for answering it. It goes to the heart of my data uh, DEI uh, campaign here. Um, uh, so I think cloud-based data lakes we're talking about are critical, right? Because on the cloud, we can actually democratize access to all of this and that's, that's uh, table stakes. Um, I think one of the most exciting things I've seen in this uh, regard is descaling data, right? Initiatives that descale data, meaning you bring data down uh, as close as possible uh, in grain size to individual users, particularly in underrepresented populations. Um, I'm working very closely with our Amazon uh, Sustainability Data Initiative on a data descaling effort in, in, in South Saharan Africa, specifically to look at um, how we can understand the implications of climate risk resilience um, for populations around which there's very little data, right? If, if you know the con concept of subsidiarity from political science, it's almost like data subsidiarity for the least served. Um, I could go on about that, but I won't. I think that's really exciting. Um, I think the other piece is around data sovereignty. Uh, and there, another, I think, version of almost sustainability where um, we're working with uh, some uh, top researchers in rare diseases, trying to create mechanisms for data sovereignty of uh, rare, rare disease patients and their families vis-a-vis -vis clinical trials, right? How do we empower the, the owners, the users of that data, because they're the ones with the disease or the caretakers of those with the disease, so that they're able to make decisions from a, a kind of self and family sovereignty perspective um, that enables them to use that data for the benefit of their families and people like them and not just you know, large commercial efforts. Um, and so I think that descaling data and, and a kind of personalized data sovereignty are really interesting strategies um, that get to this question. And uh, I hope that that's one area we could collaborate around. 
Great. That was I super just, helpful. Yeah, go ahead. I would just plus one on what Nelson has said. I, I think both efforts are, are really key. Um, in Data.org, we ran a report called RICO just recently in, in the US context by, by uh, surveying multiple local communities, often disenfranchised communities, about uh, what their concerns are about the usage of their data for health purposes. And one of the, one of the key findings was about power, how, how, how to give them the, the sovereignty, as, as Nelson was saying, to use, make decisions about their own data. So before everything else, the, the first feedback was the power is asymmetrical. Give us the ability to make decisions. And then from that, trust can flow. And then we can have a conversation about everything else. It's all about decolonizing data science. Yeah. Decolonizing <laughs> data science. That's maybe fascinating. One last, yeah, maybe yeah, one last um, point on this, because uh, it's a fabulous question. Um, I, I think one other thing that we're thinking about is design-driven AI, um, where you say, you know, typically you have, uh, you, you have the perspective where you start with data, you develop the algorithm, and only then do you toss it over the fence for people who are actually the users of it to, 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 to experience, right, the outcome of that. And what we found is that if you involve design thinking much earlier in the process and start from a user back experiential perspective, you can actually flip this AI adoption. And we've seen it um, in uh, prediction for um, uh, helping uh, people with unemployment. We've seen it with um, helping understand uh, risk uh, and, and, and measles epidemic when the measles outbreak was in Europe a few years ago. So actually it, it can fundamentally flip this AI adoption equation if you involve um, design thinking from, from the beginning. Excellent. Well, I think you have all emphasized the importance of, of co-design from start to finish. Um, this has been fascinating. I've learned a lot um, and I'm sure our audience has too. So I wanna thank you, Ashley, Nelson, Daniel for a really enlightening um, panel discussion. And I'll turn it back to Francesca now. Yes, well, just a few a very quick comments. First of all, thank you, Lisa, for moderating this amazing panel. I think we have really covered so much territory today. And one of just final thought, I mean, it's interesting as we are facing and battling a pan pan pandemic, a climate crisis and a war and many other so social and political challenges, I do think that as Nelson mentioned, we really did have an amazing opportunity to create this new movement where corporate sector, nonprofit organization, academia can really work together to achieve a very fast, impactful solution. However, as always, hard problem, these are hard problem and solution are not easy. I think I just wanna quickly um, recap some of the challenges. I mean, one is how do we find the right speed in one hand with a high, let's slow down a little bit, but also on the other hand, let's find fast solution because sometimes crisis re re require um, very quick solution to, especially to deploy responses to humanitarian crisis as we're having right now. We've talked about responsibility and trust on uh, AI. We talk about really the importance of how we build long-term partnership, long-term partnership, making sure that everyone is, has basically uh, their own win. And I think that is really important in a certain way, fresh to really talk about that very explicitly, because as we are trying to tackle this very important problem together, I think we really make, need to make sure that everyone has, has their own win. And of course, question like data, data governance uh, and building trust in data and building trust in collaboration and partnership across different sectors. So I wanted to close the panel. I want to thank you all. I, uh, I want to echo, I think, Nelson uh, comment on the chat and said, let's continue the conversation. And I think the Harvard the Science Initiative is committed to make that happen because I do think the time is right. So thank you very much for all your um, insightful comments and thank you for the audience for joining us. Also, this is event is recorded and you can watch it on YouTube. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.